So hello, everybody. Welcome to our first ever Walkinar, a virtual intro to better walking. Um, I am Jaina Victor with Commute Smart Raleigh. I'm a Commute Smart Raleigh team member with the city of Raleigh. And I'd like to thank you all for being here. And if you have uh, found your way here through mysterious ways, I'd like to briefly go over what it is that we do. We here at Commute Smart Raleigh, we provide advice and assistance to increase the use of transportation options. We do that by promoting things such as riding the bus, carpooling, fan pooling, teleworking, creative work schedules, parking cash out, biking, and of course, walking. So we do this to save people money and to improve commuter health. Let me ask everyone to mute themselves pretty please. There we go. Okay, I think we're all good now. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, but the, we do this to improve commuter health, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and more efficiently use your transportation infrastructure. So I'm super excited about our speakers, but first I did want to pass it on to my coworker, Anne. Thank you, Jana. I'm Ann Galam, the other Commute Smart Raleigh team member. Thank you all for being here. We will take questions at the end, but at any time, uh, you can write them in the chat while we're going along. If you're afraid, you'll forget them. And at the end, you can um, either I'll read from the chat or you can ask them aloud when I call your name. First of all, I'd like to introduce LaPonda Edmondson, who is the Vice President of North Carolina Healthcare Foundation. In a collaboration with hospitals, health systems, and community partners, Dr. Edmondson is responsible for leading the foundation's efforts in measuring and evaluating the performance of multiple cross-sector programs and initiatives that drive strategic impact to improve the health of North Carolinians. With over 10 years of experience in health research, evaluation, and community outreach, Dr. Edmondson is a public health practitioner with a passion for chronic disease prevention and management, eliminating health disparities and advocating for vulnerable populations. Please go ahead, Dr. Edmondson. Well, thank you, Ann, and good afternoon to everyone. I want to Thank you for that introduction and uh, many thanks to our organizers, Ann and Jaina and, and others, I'm sure, who have also been involved in into this process and to the city of Raleigh and uh, for the connection that was made by one of the boards that I have an opportunity to serve on the Raleigh Transit Authority for the invitation to participate in today's webinar. And so it's good to hear that this is the first ever Walkinar event that you all are having. So we we'll go ahead and let's uh, jump into the agenda. We do have a short agenda that we'll, we'll touch on on the next slide. And there's just a few bullets there. There we go. Um, and so there are, of course, many benefits to walking. And in today's discussion, we'll really just kind of touch on just 10 of those and then move into how can you build walking into your day-to-day uh, -day routine and then wrap up with proper walking techniques. And so um, believe it or not, there actually is a proper way to walk correctly. And so we'll just uh, touch on that briefly as well. And so on the next slide there, um, I wanted to first start off with a, a quote, and this comes from the Greek physician Hippocrates, which I'm sure many of you who have heard of him, but he is known as the father of modern medicine. And he said it best when he said, walking is man's best medicine. So although um, it seems like it's very basic, simple concept, Walking really has some significant advantages and as it relates to all of our dimensions of health, not just physical health, but also our mental health. And so we'll, we'll touch on that in just a bit. But the more that you walk, the faster, the farther, and the more frequently that you do so, the benefits only increase after that. So going into our, our top 10, uh, benefits of walking. The first there is walking really helps to help you to prevent or manage any various conditions. So when you're talking about heart disease, stroke, high blood pressure, cancer, type 2 diabetes, a lot of those cardiovascular or respiratory illnesses, walking can actually help you to prevent that or treat that. 
Then number two is also walking is incredibly beneficial for weight control. Um, as you are walking, you are burning calories. If you are to add 30 minutes of brisk walking to your daily routine, you can actually burn up to 150 calories a day. And of course, the more that you walk and at the quicker pace that you walk, you can actually burn more and actually start to begin to be able to lose weight. So if you're exercising through walking, as well as combining that with proper nutrition and a healthy diet, you can start to see that you can start burning some of that body fat as well as losing some additional pounds that you may want to lose just through walking alone. So one of the questions that I had for uh, this group today, and you can put that into the chat just so that we can make this a discussion and, and for it to be interactive for you all, is to think about in a 30 minute walk, how long would you say that you can boost your metabolism for? So if you had to take a guess and just put it quickly into the chat, how long would you say that you can boost your metabolism for? So we're saying two hours, Carolyn's saying three hours, Anne says an hour. Uh, B is saying uh, 30 minutes, two hours. Susan said all day. Well, not quite all day, but, uh, and Deborah said she used to know that. Well, you can actually boost your metabolism for up to 12 hours just by taking a 30 minute walk. So um, fascinating, but that's something that you can, you can take with you is that just with that short, even 30 minute sprint, you can um, boost your metabolism and, and start to really burn off some calories just in walking just for a short amount of time. So on the next slide, we'll go into um, the third and the fourth benefits there. Um, and so, of course, what you can also do is you can strengthen your bones and your muscles. You're engaging those, those muscles as you're walking. You're toning up your legs. You're, you're pulling on your abdominal muscles and even your arm muscles if you are, are pumping them as you're walking. And so this really helps to increase your range of motion. It's shifting the pressure and the weight that you have um, from your joints to your muscles. And so you can start to see that you're going to strengthen those bones and those muscles the more that you walk. You will also see that you can improve muscle endurance and cardiovascular fitness. So our cardiovascular fitness measures how well our body is taking in the oxygen and delivering it to our muscles and organs during prolonged periods of exercise. And, and walking is one of those ways in which you can do that. Then moving into our fifth and sixth benefit to walking. Um, walking also increases the blood flow to our brains. Um, it's linked to better cognition function and protection against decline and improved memory. There was actually a study that was cited in the New York Times. It was earlier this year, I believe, um, but it found that middle-aged and older adults with early signs of memory loss were able to raise their cognitive scores after they started walking frequently. So there's tremendous benefits there to our memory and our cognition if we are to begin to walk more. One of the questions that I also wanted to pose to this group is when you think about the average human walking speed in miles per hour, how would you, how long, I guess, how fast would you say that that is? So, Miles per hour, just throw out a couple guesses there. Oh, this group is right on it. Yeah, so you guys are right on there. So it's it's 3.1 mile, 3 miles per hour is the average human walking speed. So we actually um, have a pretty decent um, a speed on us average uh, wise. And then also going into uh, the sixth benefit to walking is that you get better sleep. Um, I know everybody could always benefit from having better sleep. And so um, when you are uh, exercising and you're doing things like walking, it actually boosts that natural sleep ho hormone, such as uh, melatonin, to be able to get you to get better rest 
And if you're walking in the morning, you actually have exposure to that bright daylight, the first thing that's in the morning. And that helps with our natural circadian rhythm. And that's the circadian rhythm helps us to be able to have that internal process that regulates our sleep wake cycle. So um, when you're out there and you're walking, you're going to be able to find that you can actually have better rest at night and better sleep because you've been able to engage in that type of form of exercise. But you also do want to be uh, mindful of, of the timing. So as you're walking and if it's right before bed, you may find that you've got yourself a little worked up. And so you may be a little bit harder to get to sleep um, if it's right before bedtime, but early in the morning or right after dinner, um, those are also really great times to engage in a walk. Then going into uh, the next slide that talks about our seventh and our eighth benefit, walking helps us to be able to build that lower body strength. And that's really important when we are looking at having good balance and coordination. And then of course, our immune system. This is our body's defense against infections and diseases. Having a strong immune system is essential to fighting off any kinds of illness. And so if you are regularly going for a walk or taking a bike ride, there are benefits to your immune system by just having that increased blood flow, you're gonna be able to see that those immune cells are performing more effectively. It's gonna reduce the stress and inflammation and strengthen antibodies. So there are also benefits to your overall health and your immune system if you are able to engage in some walking on a regular basis. And then moving into our ninth and our 10th benefit. So these are our last two in terms of benefits. Um, walking pr promotes the release of brain chemicals called those endorphins. And that helps to stimulate relaxation and improves your mood. It also helps to reduce stress and tension. So walking gives you time to think, to, to get away, to be able to get away from any kind of stressors that you may have to clear your mind. And in that same vein, as you have your mind clear, you may also find yourself having more of those aha moments or innovative ideas because walking has been also linked to increased creativity. So you're able to, to kind of come up with some of those new approaches that maybe you hadn't thought of before you got onto a walk. And then lastly for this section, um, and that's just, a, I'm sorry, last bullet number 10, uh, there we go, um, is uh, if you are switching to walking or cycling um, for your journeys that you're having, it helps to protect the environment. Um, so when you are not engaging and driving your vehicle, it creates less noise, less air pollution. You have fewer, um, uh, of course, it results in fewer emissions within the environment and helps to protect our green spaces. Um, so a question that I have is, if you guys could take a guess, how much would you say if you are walking at least 10 miles each week, how much would you be able to eliminate in terms of pounds of carbon dioxide emissions each year? It's a pretty heavy amount. So if you are walking 10 miles every week, how much carbon, re carbon dioxide emissions would be eliminated in terms of pounds? So B is saying 20 pounds, Anne is saying 1,000, Deborah says 100. So the number is actually in between a, a little bit there. Um, so it's actually gonna be 500 pounds of carbon dioxide emissions can be eliminated just if we are walking 10 miles each week. Okay, so, um, okay. And so John is making a comment, we can add benefit 11. Um, so uh, there's, there's many different benefits to, to, to being able to walk. And as we're looking at how can you engage in walking, uh, you can, of course, always have this be a part of your exercise routine, but walking is just also just simple day-to-day -day things that we can do in order to be able to increase our steps and get us really moving. So instead of taking the elevator, 
You can decide to, I'm gonna skip the elevator and actually take the stairs. Um, hopefully you all have had an opportunity to take part in our uh, wonderful public transportation system that we have here, Go Raleigh, right in this area. Fares have been, of course, suspended throughout uh, the year and into mid next year so you can ride for free. But if you are to, to get off just even one stop earlier and walk the rest of the way to work or to home, you can actually get some additional steps and really start to reap the benefits of, of being able to, to walk more. Um, also, walking in short bouts before, after, or during your lunch. Um, it may be, I'm going to start off with five minutes this week before work, and then two weeks from now, I'm going to increase that five minutes to go to 10 minutes or 15 minutes, and so on and so forth. And so what you'll find is that you'll be able to increase the amount of time that you spend walking just by having those short bouts throughout the day. Also, um, you know, we're in a pretty good area here in Raleigh and connected to a lot of great local shops and, and restaurants and grocery stores. So instead of hopping in the car, decide to take a walk and, and travel to, to one of those shops. Get out there, walk the dog, head to the park. This picture here on the screen is actually a photo that I took several weeks ago when I was over at Green Hills County Park in Raleigh. And so such a beautiful day. I said, let me take a, take a photo, save this moment. And so um, decided to share that with you all today. And then lastly, make it fun, right? And so we're able to start to see more people now. Hopefully conditions will continue to improve. So invite a friend or go out with the family, um, have them also engage in walking with you. The weather is really great you know, um, try different courses. You don't want to get bored. You want to kind of change things up. So maybe look at different routes that you can take, different uh, parks that you might want to go on to. Try a new trail, join a, a walking group, uh, participate in a challenge that you may have through work. So there's a number of different ways that you just want to keep it, keep some variety in there, keep it fun, keep it fresh. But of course, we're going to do things that we actually enjoy. And so making it fun is also important as well. And so, um, yeah, go ahead and start putting into the comments some ways that that you might incorporate walking into your day. Um, Susan shared with her with us that her husband and her have been walking in all of the Raleigh's greenways. And so that that's fantastic. Those are really great opportunities for you to be able to get out there and to to increase your your walking. And so on the, the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about the proper walking technique. And, you know, we learned how to walk at a very early age, but um, there is a way to walk um, and, and to make sure that we are getting the, the most out of, of, of what we are doing. And so you want to make sure that your, your head is held up high, that you're not looking um, just on the ground, that you keep your, your chin parallel to the ground, that you're really engaging those abdominal muscles and keeping those tight, and then using those arms also when you're walking as well. So these are just some examples of the things that as you are walking or engaging in a walking program that you want to be mindful of um, as you are um, getting out there. Okay. And so um, that is the, the last slide that I have for this section and, and really kind of wraps up most of my time here. I uh, hope that you were able to take away some, some, some nuggets with you and some helpful tips as you either begin to start walking or hopefully start walking more. Um, for those of you who are avid walkers, you may want to think about ways in which you can take your walking up to the next level. So uh, maybe doing some interval training as we've heard about, adding some weights, you know, going up hills, using the incline. There's a number of ways that you can continue to keep yourself moving forward and keep challenging yourself in new and different ways. Um, but 
make sure that you're you're uh, if you're new to this and and you haven't been walking maybe in a while that you check in with your healthcare provider to make sure that it's safe to do so. You don't want to ever begin anything new without checking in with your provider that that knows your medical history and can also speak to that as well. But there are some remarkable uh, benefits that are connected to just walking. It's something very simple. We all do it. We don't even think about it, um, but there are tremendous impacts for our overall health. And um, since we started with a quote, I'll leave you with this. And this one is with uh, from Charles Dickens. And he said, the best way to lengthen out our days is to walk steadily and with a purpose. So thank you so much for your time. And with that, I will turn it back over to Anne. Thank you, Dr. Edmondson. I had anticipated learning something, but I learned a lot. So thank you so much. Um, next, we're gonna take a quick break before our next speaker and show you a brand new Commute Smart Raleigh walking safety video. Bear with us, folks. The bus stop or even to your car in front of your house. Keep that moment. Commute Smarter, Not Harder, presented by Commute Smart Raleigh. Today we will talk about the walk. There are many ways to get to your workplace, but if you live about two miles or less from your job, have you considered a pedestrian commute? Even though walking to work is often overlooked, nearly every commute starts with a walk, whether it is to the bus stop or even to your car in front of your house. Keep that momentum going if you're able and consider all of the benefits it comes with. Walking is free. It can help you stay in shape. Walking lowers stress levels and provides some more me time. Walking is much more environmentally friendly than a lot of other commute options. Of course, we want you to stay safe during your walk, so please keep the following tips in mind. Wear bright colors or reflective gear, especially in the winter months when it gets dark earlier. Always cross at intersections or crosswalks. And even if it is your turn, look before crossing and watch for turning cars. Make eye contact with any drivers before crossing to make sure they see you. Obey any and all traffic signals. If there is no sidewalk, walk as far off the roadway as possible and walk against traffic so you can see the cars heading your way. Avoid crossing between parked cars so you don't surprise a driver. Don't talk or look at your cell phone or wear earphones when crossing the street so that you are alert. Pedestrians do not always have the right of way, and drivers are not always as alert as we want them to be. So please obey the rules and follow our tips to stay safe for your healthy and cost-free walking commute. And lastly, be prepared and wear comfortable shoes. You can bring a change of clothes for when you arrive to work. If you have any further questions on how to safely enjoy a walking commute or any other way to get to work, please contact us at commute at raleighnc.gov. I hope you enjoyed that. Okay, so next we have Paul Black. Paul is the Bicycle and Pedestrian Program Manager for the City of Raleigh. He has more than 20 years of experience working on both planning and geographic information systems. His emphasis is using technology to frame public debates around transportation and land use. Paul, please go ahead. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Glad to be here today. Um, I've got a short presentation, and even though it's a walk in our, I have to talk about bike stuff just because that's what we do. Uh, for the sake of time, I'm going to just jump right in here 
and uh, start talking about the two big programs that we've got. Um, there should be one slide right before this one. There we go, in between, yep. <laughs> so this is our starting slide. Next slide should be the one with the black background and all the yellow stuff all over it. There we go. So these are bike facilities that are going down uh, this year. Most of them are in street uh, striped bike lanes. Um, why does that matter for a walk in our? Well, if there's a bike lane, it helps me get bikes off the sidewalks. Bicycles are allowed on the sidewalk in the city of Raleigh, unless a bicycle lane is present. Uh, for the walk side of things, we don't have an interpretation on whether you're allowed to walk in the bike lane or not. You're definitely allowed to walk across a bike lane. Whether or not you can use a bike lane for a travel lane hinges on some a specific word in the code. And we have asked our lawyers for an interpretation. With all of the new bike facilities going down, we're getting complaints from bicyclists about pedestrians using the bike lane. Uh, in fact, with the uh, Bluegrass Festival this past weekend downtown, uh, I had a lot of complaints when I arrived on Monday morning about people using the bike lanes for walking. Um, next slide, please. So this is what we've got on deck for next year for bikes, just our standalone program. Now, most of our bike program is actually out of our control and it's opportunistic. We uh, go along with much larger roadway projects. Um, and if we can get a bike lane as part of that, we will do so. The same is true for private development. Um, and we have a major change going to city council today. Uh, we will see where that goes, but that should help get us additional bike lanes through private development. And finally, any uh, resurfacing and maintenance that happens. Uh, if we call for a bike lane in the bike plan and can fit it within the existing curbs, we will go ahead and do that. So this is what's left over to plug up all the gaps. Um, two here that I wanna point out are uh, State Street, which goes underneath Interstate 40 to the south. We have already gone out and done a pop-up there last spring and are continuing to work with the community to try and make sure that the project will fit what they want to do. And then up just north of downtown, the second half of an east-west connector and Whitaker Mill bike lanes. Whitaker Mill is quite complicated. We tried to do it last year, so keep, keep your fingers crossed on that one. But those are the, the two we wanted to show. Next slide. Bike share. Again, as you're doing your commute, as you're doing your trips, um, maybe it's a little too far to walk. Uh, bike share and dockless scooters fill that gap and extend your range. You're still walking from the bike share station to your destination or back to the bike share, but this increases your range as a pedestrian. And so far it's been a very popular program in the city. Um, so talking about where we'll go from the initial expansion or from the initial installation. Uh, next slide. There's our current system. And the next slide will show where we're looking at additional stations. We've got one at Lane Street and one at Gateway Plaza. These will be our first that were done through private development with a partnership with the city. Next slide. And when you add those all up, we've got a number of stations going in either through private development, through the bus rapid transit project on Newburn Avenue, and then a few that the city is looking to fill gaps with our own program. We can fund two, maybe three a year, depending on circumstances and we look to fill in holes in the system. The two big ones on our radar right now are Five Points, which was the number one most requested station that we were unable to do in the initial batch of 30. The other is City Plaza, which is another that we were not able to do in the original batch of 30 because of some physical issues with the actual surface. If you've ever been to City Plaza, it looks like a street, but there's actually a parking deck underneath. So doing things on top of that is very complicated. Next slide. And we talk a lot about bike lanes. We don't talk so much about the parking. Again, you're gonna do a walk from wherever you park your bike. And traditionally, we've just put the standard bike racks out front, people lock up. We're finding for people that need longer term parking, either all day during a work day, or maybe overnight for some of the new residential buildings that have gone up and downtown. We really need to have enclosed and covered spaces for bike storage. We do have that written into our development ordinances. It um, doesn't apply to everybody, but it does apply to larger developments and certain land uses. We still have our public URAC program where people can request additional bike parking. It does have to be in the right of way. If you wanna do it on private property, that's still on you. We can uh, send you to the development services folks. 
and give you all the city specifications. Um, but we can put additional racks in the right of way on request. Uh, we're doing our first scooter corral pilot. And from a walking standpoint, this is a big issue. Um, I know that scooters in the travel way for pedestrians have been a huge issue. It's an even bigger issue for folks who may have sen sensory impairments, whether it's walking or hearing, they don't hear scooters coming if they're operating on the sidewalk. Uh, they're not supposed to be, but they do. And if they're parked, sometimes it's hard for visually impaired uh, travelers to see or, or know that those scooters are there. So the scooter corral is our first attempt to try and bring a little bit of order to what's generally been a chaotic parking scene. It'll be on Glenwood Avenue between Hillsborough Street and Peace Street. And uh, the way we're doing it is you can still park your scooter anywhere you want. But if you're on Glenwood Avenue, if you don't park it in one of these corrals, the meter will continue to run and charge you. So if you want your trip to stop and not continue to be charged, you will have to park in one of these zones. Um, we hope that that will uh, be a great fix and we can continue to expand that program uh, provided it's successful. And then finally, the downtown bike parking. Uh, you can see this example. This is an employee rack at, at uh, the Raleigh Municipal Building. We would like to open some of these up to the public and install maybe one or two additional from what's already there. Uh, we have already been talking with McLaurin, or they're not McLaurin Parking anymore, they're the car park. Um, they're a national company that does parking management. They already have some of these in other cities that they manage. And uh, we are hoping we can have something ready to go within the next year to two years where someone could go into the car park office and say, I want to have a monthly you know, slot spot at one of these public bike parking areas and they get a badge. So it's not a free for all, but there is a cost, but you would then be able to go in and use this indoor protected parking whenever you, you wanted to. So if you were a commuter and wanted to leave your bike in a nice dry safe place while you're at work, you'd be able to do that. Right now that's only available to city employees. Next slide. Bike month, I'll skip through this. The reason I wanted to show this is we've been doing bike month for a long time and we're pretty good at it. You can see some of the events that we did. Next slide. Um, but we want to expand that to do some more things. So this year because of uh, COVID, and some of the restrictions, we had to get really creative. And I think there's some carryover into other parts of our program. This being ARCS, uh, we, we worked with the art community to do a mural and activate this space. Before it felt really dingy and kind of industrial, even though it was new, we almost never saw a bike actually locked up there. The mural started to go in, it wasn't even in. And the artist said, all of a sudden, people started locking their bikes up here while I was working. Um, it completely transformed the space and uh, it was a huge success. Um, and again, things like the bike on bus video, um, there's a lot of different ways people get around and it might not be just one for your trip. You might, you know, bike on bus, you walk or you ride your bike to where it's gonna lock up and then you're gonna walk to your place of employment. So next slide. Um, again, just, this is what we're doing for bike month. We'd like to start doing this more for what we're doing here in October with walking. Next slide, please. So finally, onto the walking part, pedestrian programs. Um, I'm on the planning side of things, and we are pretty good at sidewalks. We just don't do a good job telling our story. Um, a lot of that is because much of it is operational. A lot of it gets done with our development ordinances, and a lot of the capital projects, they get teed up. They go over to our engineering services folks and they get in the hopper to get built by private construction companies. So on the planning side, we're less involved, but it doesn't mean we aren't getting projects on the ground. So I'm gonna go over real quick how we get new sidewalks, what those programs and policies look like, um, some of the technical operational details of crosswalks and signals, because we get a lot of questions about those. And then finally, what we're doing to make Walktober a larger event. Next slide. So I just got finished mapping. We had a uh, new aerial photography came in and I went back to the end of 2018 when we did our last major update. And uh, we have added 23 miles of new sidewalk in the city of Raleigh, which is in the blue highlights in the map. It's spread out around town, although you can see that kind of north, northeast section uh, has had a lot of activity. And that's all the private development. All the new subdivisions that have gone in out there are getting sidewalks based on requirements in our development ordinance. 
We do have a few projects that were city or NCDOT initiated. One that you can see even at this scale is on the border with Cary across Interstate 40. We expanded and improved an existing sidewalk there and added sidewalk on another side that wasn't there before. So we have five programs. Development is really the bulk of where sidewalks happen. That is where we're getting the most bang for the buck. Uh, NCDOT and the city both have a street, complete streets policy that mean whenever something happens, we go in and we will add sidewalk as part of any kind of changes that occur um, that are pretty major. With maintenance, we don't just because we don't want to slow down the maintenance. We don't want it to get too complicated. That gets into our capital and streetscape programs. Those are uh, bigger projects that usually council votes on. Often they are bond projects. In NCDOT's case, they are federally funded in many cases. And those are the really big visible projects. For us, there are just a few that are sidewalk only. The bulk of them are road projects where we also get sidewalks as part of a road project. Um, you know, if you want to look at some right now, Yonkers Road on the east side of the city, we're getting a brand new side path the entire length of the new road. Uh, our neighborhood petition program gets things that are not major streets. Uh, these oftentimes are in conflict with trees. So everybody would think, hey, a sidewalk's great, but wait, you're gonna take out the crepe myrtles in front of my house. Okay, I don't want a sidewalk after all. Um, that was where this program grew out of and why it is a petition process. They wanna demonstrate that the neighborhood is very interested in having that sidewalk. So it's very, I don't know, it's very involved and it takes a lot of effort to get a successful petition over to council to vote on. What we found is that the program is um, generally more successful in neighborhoods where people have the time and have the ability to pursue that process. And there are some equity concerns that we're reevaluating right now. And then finally, our smallest program, the MicroGap and the Safe Routes to School. We look at very, very short segments that were missed because of changes in our ordinance over the years. Um, it might be that in 1980, we required a sidewalk on one side of a new subdivision. And then in 1990, we didn't require anything and the corner lot got built with no sidewalks. And then in 2000, the rest of a new subdivision got built with sidewalks on both sides. Well, now that one corner lot has no sidewalks and there's a gap between the two. That's where this program comes in. It hasn't been as successful as we would like because it's been very difficult to get contractors to come and work on just a small segment of sidewalk. Um, so the way I phrase it is, if I'm a concrete you know, sidewalk contractor, I can go out into South Wake and work in the same subdivision all week, and I only have to move my equipment on Monday and Friday. Why would I come to the city of Raleigh where I'm going to do this in the morning, and then I have that same cost? So we're looking for ways to bundle projects so that there is an economy of scale and make it more economically feasible for the contractors. Next slide. So crosswalks. Again, we get a lot of questions. At the planning level, I'm not really heavily involved in this. This is much more of an operational maintenance concern. Where we get involved is, what's the threshold for putting in a different kind of crosswalk? Um, we're gonna talk about that here in a minute. Um, but we do wanna look at ramps. So I'm getting new bike lanes on Rush Street as part of a resurfacing. That's down in Southeast Raleigh. So I drove by to see how they were doing. And uh, they were busy putting in all new curb ramps. And I thought, you know, here we are, you know, doing lots of bike stuff, but this bike project, which is, you know, very visible, we're not talking about how we go in and fix the ramps. When we do resurfacing, part of our Americans with Disabilities Act plan, which was, it's ancient, it goes back to the early 1990s, says when we go in there and do a major resurfacing, we're going to bring all of our ramps up to snuff. So even though it's a resurfacing that happens to have a bike lane project, though it also happens to have a pedestrian element. And we don't do a good job telling that story. And that's another Walktober thing we want to try and do better. Um, and then finally, what are the different signal types and what are the criteria for getting signals? Next slide. So for ramps, there are two standards. One is the Americans with Disabilities Act. The other one is PROWAG. Um, and I forget exactly what it stands for, but 
the main difference is that ADA is really about sites and buildings. And it sometimes comes up short when you're talking about working in the right of way. ProWag was designed specifically for rights of way in streets. And so it's, a, it's actually a little bit higher of a standard in many ways. Next slide. Crosswalks are based on conditions. The high visibility, which is really a preference, is also more expensive to keep up and maintain as well as put in on the first go. So we don't wanna just do those everywhere from a cost maintenance standpoint. So there are thresholds. So a lot of it has to do with either pedestrian volume or vehicle volume or a combination of both. In some cases, it also has to do with things like sight distance or past uh, pedestrian injuries. Um, so all of those things feed into whether or not you get a high vis or something else. So that's the piano key that you see there. The standard parallel bars are gonna be more for cross streets, residential areas, the volumes are lower, but there's still some kind of marking needed. And then finally, there's a lot of you know, residential streets. There's no markings at all. There's a crosswalk implied because there's a sidewalk on either side. Legally, that still counts as a crosswalk in the traffic code, but we don't mark it. Again, there's a maintenance and a cost associated with that. So one quick aside, people are always asking, hey, we wanna decorate a crosswalk. At least right now, Federal Highway has said, the only thing you can do to paint a crosswalk is to paint it like it's brick. So if you can't afford brick, you can paint it to look like brick, and that's really where it stops. Um, there are jurisdictions that have said we're going to do it anyway, at least at the city of Raleigh. The, the engineers that have to sign off on pavement markings have been unwilling to do that. Um, there's a liability concern for them. That's if we deviate from the federal standard, it, it, we could potentially be liable in a lawsuit. Um, so even though it's out there, you may have seen it. I know that Chapel Hill has done it. Um, at least in the city of Raleigh, uh, we've still been unwilling to do that. I think there is a larger national debate that continues to kind of chip away at the fact that there's no safety data to show that we need to make it so restrictive. Um, but until the powers that be at Federal Highway change their minds, this is the reality that I'm working in. Um, one other thing I will point out on the high vis is we are working with side paths that are both pedestrian and bicycle. We are going to uh, go back and retrofit as many of those as we can afford per year with the high vis And the thinking there is that you should expect bicycle traffic, which might be coming faster than a pedestrian. Our average bicycle speed, we factor it at about 10 miles an hour. So that's faster than the 3.1 that we talked about earlier for pedestrians. And so punching up the visibility of those crosswalks for the motorists, uh, we thought was important. And uh, there's quite a lot of them. Um, but we thought, you know, really this does make some sense. Next slide. So signals, we often get asked, um, not just for pedestrian signals, but for stoplights in general, they have to meet warrants for traffic. Um, there might be some older signals that are out there that are, you know, maybe don't meet today's warrants and they haven't ever been taken out. Um, the reason for this is twofold. The obvious is operation and maintenance costs. Uh, the other one, though, is uh, stoplights tend to increase the number of rear end collisions for cars. So there is additional liability. If you put in a signal where there isn't one shown to be needed, there's a potential liability there um, outside of just the maintenance cost. So on the pedestrian side, what are the things we care about? Um, we look at those countdowns. Those have been really helpful. And I think that we have actually started factoring in our pedestrian speed to be slower than the 3.1. I want to say we've been using 2.8. Again, I'm not the engineers. Don't hold me to that. I'm just a planner. But we want to make sure that people who maybe are not average can still make the crossing safely. Uh, we're looking at adding leading pedestrian intervals. That's where the, the, the little white light walking person comes on. But the green light for the cars has a delay. It allows the pedestrians to get out in the street and be seen by all the cars before the cars are allowed to enter the intersection. Um, it's one of the cheapest and best tools we have for increasing pedestrian safety in a downtown setting. Audible signals are still by request in the city. That's where you, you know, hear the you know, walk, walk. It's safe to walk. Um, sometimes it's just beeping. There's a lot of different ways that that can be done. They are expensive. 
And so we uh, generally respond to, to requests from visually impaired individuals, and they will tell us, you know, these are areas where I will be walking on a regular basis from my home to a bus stop or from home to employment. Um, can you add out audible signals? And the city does our best, but uh, it's not a standard simply because of cost. And then finally, bicycle specific signals. There are none of these in the city of Raleigh, but we are approved by FHWA to use them. Uh, we've had a couple of projects that we have looked at, but the costs are quite high in many cases. Charlotte does have some installed. So if you are in Charlotte um, and you wanna see some, there are some on the ground already. Next slide. So Walktober, there's some things, there's some things that have already happened there. We already had a historic church walk on the second, that was over the weekend. Uh, we've got the virtual presentation today. Here you are. Uh, National Walk to School Day is tomorrow. Um, the 15th is quite busy. Uh, we're doing a joint event with the White Cane Society to bring awareness of visually impaired as pedestrians. And um, there's also a walking and biking safety summit afterwards. There's a, our first ever true open street event um, that's just there to talk about mobility in the streets is on uh, October 17th. Uh, we're going to be closing Lenore Street between Dix Park and Chavis Park all the way across downtown. We're also going to have a traffic garden at Chavis Park um, that a lot of people focus on the bike element, but it's really there to, to just promote traffic safety in general for children. And then there's a cemetery walk the night before Halloween. It's probably sold out already. This is a popular one every year. Uh, but if you want to see more, the uh, addresses are at the bottom, or you can just go to the City of Raleigh website and search on Walktober. Next slide. Traffic garden. Um, again, this is a picture from, I don't know if this is ours or not. Somebody will have to tell me. Um, but uh, we've, we did one on State Street back in May. And uh, the Chavis Park one will be a part of that larger stroll in the streets event. Next slide. So finally, the count program. And I stuck this at the end because it is both a bike and head program. Uh, with the exception of Cameron Village, which is a pedestrian only counter, they count both bicycles and pedestrian. There are 17 uh, counters around the city. They are mostly on the Greenway, as you can see. Again, the map is very small, but if you can see where the labels are, it gives you an idea that most of these are on the Greenway. Uh, there are some around NC State campus into downtown. So I, I think on street, I have a Ridge Road. I have one on East Hargett. I have one on Hillsborough Street near the YMCA, and I have the one on Cameron Street in Cameron Village. All of the rest are on greenways or side paths. Um, they are cheaper to install because I can get both directions of bikes and peds without installing a counter on two sides. So I get a twofer on the greenways. Uh, we have two additional counters slated to be installed. They're sitting under my desk at Raleigh City Hall right now. Uh, one of them will be on Industrial Drive, uh, which is uh, south of the Trader Joe's and the Costco off of Six Forks Road. Originally slated to be in the street, I found out that Parks and Recreation has acquired the property to make a full connection to the Greenway at the southern end of Industrial Drive. So they are going to be building that and paving it, and we are going to move the counter to the Greenway entrance for the same reason. Will then be able to get walkers and bikers going in both directions. Uh, the other one is a suburban location because we don't have any good suburban counts. So we are looking to just say, where's a typical suburban location? And we're going to be doing one on Hardemont uh, Drive, which is east of North Hills. And I think this may be the last slide. There may be one more. Next slide, please. Ah, that's right. So because we don't have counters everywhere, we do rely on third-party data. Um, this is a, a look at a Strava heat map for bicycles. So one of the issues I run into using these data are people say, oh, those Strava people, they're all clad up in Lycra with their legs shaved and flying down the road. Um, I will admit that I have been one of those people and I can tell you that they're not riding here. Um, they go out to the edge of the, the triangle and they immediately get out into the country. If you ever get a chance to look, if you zoom out, you can see that every major city is ringed by a web of rural streets with lots and lots of bike people on it. That's where those people are riding. They wanna get out there and do 50 or 75 miles and go fast. You can't do that in an urban setting. So most of these are people who are commuting, who are riding recreationally for fitness. Um, 
we're able to then take these data and say, based on some, some studies we've done, in fact, one was just done by NCDOT in the city of Charlotte, we know that for every Strava trip that passes any given point, it's probably about six to seven actual bike trips that are observed on site. And so it helps us get an idea of where the demand is. We can look at places that we know don't feel good from a bicycle stress standpoint and say, we know there's bikes here and we know it's stressful. This is a great place to do a project. Um, and that's where these data really become quite helpful. Um, it was interesting going through their data. If you knock back the trip length to say, I only wanna see trips shorter than five miles, you really see Hillsborough Street west out to the art museum and the Avent Ferry Corridor going from the student housing up to both Centennial and main campus at NCSU. Um, so again, there's lots of different ways to slice and dice and data, the data, but I'm always having to talk about this isn't that person. This is not those Likercrad folks out in the countryside in big groups. Um, they're on here, but they're probably not doing these rides and, and going where these people are going. It really helps show where the preferred routes are going to be. Um, one other thing I'll bring up on this particular map, um, Wade Avenue is east-west on here. You see it kind of bumpy. Um, not as much east-west interest in the actual bikes. They all tend to go down to Hillsborough Street, which is lit up really, really white. Anybody want to take a guess as to why? I'll watch the chat for a minute and then I'll give the answer. <laughs> it's very hilly. Hillsborough Street is the ridge and you don't have to go up and down, up and down, up and down. Any of you who've ridden on Wade Avenue know how hilly that is. And let me tell you, it's even more fun on a bicycle. Um, we thought, well, e-bikes are coming. That'll solve it. Uh, one, of our, one of our commissioners is an e-bike rider and she said, I don't ride there because it drains my battery and I can't go as far. <laughs> um, so we thought that was interesting. Um, I don't really have anything else on this one though, but it's always fun. I love looking at the data to see what it does. So we're trying to do a better job telling our story. We're trying to get our statistics out there on an annual basis, usually sometime in December or January after construction season is wrapped up. We're able to figure out how much we actually got on the ground and we've got nice pictures to show. So watch for that sometime in January. Next slide, and that should be the end. Yep, so I love this picture. I took this at the state fair. So you can see there, we've got bikes. We've got people walking to get on the bus. We've got a great wide sidewalk there. It's sort of all the other modes all in one place. Thank you, Paul. I, I learned a lot from that one too. That was great, thank you so much. Okay, well, I'd like to thank both our speakers today, and I'm going to take some questions. I'm going to start with the chat, and you're welcome, as a reminder, to either write your question in the chat, or if you're interested in speaking it aloud, maybe just raise your hand either on screen on, uh, with your video on or with your, you know, your little hand that you use, and I will call your name, and you can do that. So... I saw a question way back by Paul Straw that I was interested in hearing the answer to as well. And this was for Dr. Edmondson. Let's say I can only dedicate an hour to walking per day since a 30 minute walk can boost metabolism for 12 hours. Is it a healthier option to take two 30 minute walks throughout the day, morning and evening, or is a one hour walk healthier? Well, thank you for the question, Paul. And I will say um, it really just depends also when you say healthier, I, I think that the, the consensus there is going to be, it is most important to be able to focus on the total exercise time per day or per week. That's what's gonna matter the most, whether it's broken up into, you know, an hour is broken up into 15 minute chunks or it's broken up into to 30 minute chunks. That really just depends on, you know, what your goals may be and maybe what you are gonna be doing within that time. So if you're looking at, hey, I wanna maybe burn some more calories um, or, um, if I want to, you know, lose weight or um, things of that nature, then you may want to say, hey, I, I'm, I'm open and I have the timing to be able to do a longer walk. 
and I want to make sure that I'm at the right intensity. So is this going to be a stroll? Is it going to be a brisk walk? Um, are you going to be walking up hills? Um, are you going to be walking on pretty much flat surfaces? So it's really going to just depend there. I mean, there's research studies that say, you know, it's better to, to walk you know, two 30 minute stints. And then there's going to also be research out there that says that if you want to improve your endurance, that you're going to want to walk for a longer period of time. But the consensus there is mostly that it, it goes back to the total amount of, of exercise that you can get per day and per week. And it's going to also be based on your lifestyle and what you are able to do. And so for most people, it might not be feasible for them to say, hey, I can dedicate an hour at one time. So you want to be able to make sure that you can get that hour in or that 30 minutes in, and that's going to be the, the primary goal. And so if you've got to break that up into chunks, it's better to do some than to, to do none at all. Does that help to, to get to your question, Paul? Yeah, that, that was great. Yeah, I just didn't realize the, uh, the the beneficial impacts to your metabolism for a 30 minute walk. So um, I usually try to squeeze in at least one workout a day or the time can vary sometimes, but um, uh, that's, that's really good to know. I, I think I might try to modify maybe some of my workout routine based off of that. So thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Of course, the more that you walk, the further, the faster, um, you know, and, and the length of time, the benefits only increase from there. And thank you for the question. Okay, I'm gonna ask a question of Paul. Um, it looks like you said some bike related stuff. So we have a bike question. Deborah Franklin would like to know, have bike thefts increased in Raleigh? And that's for Paul Black. Yeah, you know, I have no idea. That would be a question for Raleigh Police Department who I'm trying to get to come to our uh, Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Committee to report on crashes. So uh, I will add that to the ask. Yeah, I, I, yeah, it's an interesting question because I feel like we have more cyclists. So it's a possibility that it has just increased just because there's more bikes around. Um, let's see. I had, does anyone else have a question they'd like to speak a lot? Oh, here we go. Sorry, sorry. There's one more in the chat. Uh, two more, actually. So uh, from Sean McKee, is there an estimate, and this is for Paul Black, is there an estimate on when the sidewalk petition program will restart? The website previously said August 2021, but now there isn't a time frame. Yeah, and the reason there's not is, we're really, it was at first just a budget issue. We had more in the hopper that were approved than we had money for, and we were just going to wait for the money to catch up. But I think the current council has some concerns about the how, how equitable the program is. Again, we're seeing that uh, most of the successful petitions are in relatively affluent neighborhoods that have people with the resources to go through the petition process. And so we're stepping back and saying, is this program doing everything we need it to do? So our capital projects are all going to be on big major streets, generally with bus you know, infrastructure on it. We're trying to fill gaps on places like Glenwood Avenue with that program. And then our micro gaps get all those little tiny bits in the subdivisions and everything else in the middle is through petition. And so we're looking at that holistically to say, is this doing what we need it to do? So the answer is, I don't know when it will restart. I can say it may look different when it does. Okay, um, it is one. I have one more question, but if you could just briefly answer it, Paul, how can we slow motor vehicle traffic down in downtown? I saw that come in from Tom and was actually starting to answer that in the chat. The city uh, and the state uh, did a joint study looking at uh, pedestrian safety in the northern part of downtown around the state campus, um, which is the legislature, the Archdale building, everything up on the north end. Um, it was based on a pedestrian fatality that occurred two years ago. And we are now working with DOT to slow traffic throughout downtown to 25 miles an hour, make that the posted speed on everything except for Dawson and McDowell. On Dawson and McDowell, we've still left it as a posted 35, but we've actually dropped the synchronized signals to about 30.6 miles an hour. So for those of you who want to drive through downtown without having to stop, 30 miles an hour. 
Once you get the first one, you should be able to go on through. But it had been set to 35. And so without doing anything, we've already seen a slowdown uh, of the traffic there. Uh, we're also looking at doing uh, no turn on red, making that the default so that where there is a turn on red, there's a specific reason why. Um, and that goes throughout the downtown grid. I don't know when they'll actually do that, but DOT is, has already said we're on board with this based on our own work. So it's just a matter of working through the details. It is a synchronized signal system throughout downtown. So anytime we touch it, we touch the whole thing. It's very complex, um, but it's in the works. Thanks, Paul. That's all the time we have for questions. Thank you all so much for being here. I'm gonna turn it over to Jaina to close this out. Yes, thank you. Um, this has been great. So if you have any comments, concerns, or anything, please contact us at commute at rawlync.gov. We appreciate um, anything and everything so we can approve upon our Walktober programming going forward. And I put a couple links in the chat. I know Deborah put in a link for the Bike Walk Summit coming up in November, which is great. Also, our friends at Go Triangle in, uh, in collaboration with a bunch of our partners throughout the region um, put up some, uh, are putting on on October 14th a webinar as well to find your cycling community. But we also have so many more Walktober events going on this month. So if you go to raleighnc.gov, search the keyword Walktober, you can find them all. Um, that will include, uh, so, I mean, Paul touched upon some of them, but we've got our scooter school safety event coming up this weekend, which will be great for people to learn how to safely ride their scooters without impeding pedestrian traffic and whatnot. And uh, also we have our bike walk rail tour, which will include an actual exclusive tour of Raleigh Union Station as well. So just check that out on raleighnc.gov uh, keyword Walktober. And other than that, um, thank you guys so much for participating and asking questions. And it has been very informative and uh, have a great day. Happy Walktober and happy strolling.